you, and we are going to start worship, that we're going to do the call to worship that we did last week. So stand with me. And I've got on here in my notes, gird up your loins. And we're going to take off with these choruses and sing through them. So you just sing along with us. Here we go, alive, alive. Alive.
can mess so many things up. I, I know I didn't count that right. But did you see? You didn't even tell it. You couldn't even tell it, could you? They just are picking up the pieces, and I've got to scatter it all around. So do you think God is hearing our praises? Amen. 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 That's what we're going to sing this next song. Hear our praises. Hymn number 12. Let's sing it together. I love to sing this with the congregation. Hear our praises. Uh, with uh, her work in Haiti, 
But next week is a uh, business meeting, and I have a request to make concerning the sound. But we were talking this morning, and uh, because uh, the only thing worse than my hearing is my vision, I can't always hear how loud I get, and I, I cause great thunderous applause in the, in the sound. So anyway, I apologize for that. But and this is one of those songs that I was doing it. Uh, I was singing a little too loud. But we're going to sing Open Up the Heavens because... We want to see, we want what God wants for us. Amen? Amen. The only giver is God. So that's what we're going to sing together. You stay on your feet. We'll sing together. Open up the heavens.
the way he can. And it's a story about Jesus. And I just kept thinking about this hymn this week. And uh, I, I don't know, children or grandchildren or great-grandchildren, whatever you have, maybe a, a spouse. I, I, I'm not sure, but I think it's important that we continue to remind the scripture remind each other about remind each other about God's goodness about those stories amen this is just a reminder of what my
blood poured out for us the weight of every curse upon you. One final breath he gave as heaven looked away. The Son of God was laid in darkness. A battle in the grave. The war on death was waged. The power of hell forever broken. The ground began to shake. The stone
If you have your Bibles with you, I want to invite you to turn with me, if you will, to the New Testament, once again to the Gospel according to John. John chapter 2, and we'll begin reading with verse 1. John chapter 2, beginning with verse 1, and as we continue our study of this book, I want to speak to you this morning on a miracle with a message. John chapter 2, beginning with verse 1, and in reverence to God's word, you stand. You be attentive as I read this portion of Scripture. The third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said unto him, They've no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. But his mother said unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And there were set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purification of the Jews, containing two or three firkins of peace. And Jesus said unto them, Fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said unto them, Draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast, and they bear it. And when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom and said unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine. And when men had well drunk, then that which is worse, but thou hast filled the good wine until now. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cain of Galilee and manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed on him. You may be seated. Bow with me. Our Father, we thank you for a wonderful time of worship this morning. Lord, we thank you for the testimonies that we were privileged to hear. And Father, we thank you now for this time that we can open your word and know that you're going to speak to our hearts. So Lord, I pray that each and every one of us here would forget all about what's going on in the world and just concentrate on hearing you. Lord, just, just speak to us today. Lord, we want to see you. Lord, we want to experience you in all of your glory. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. As a means of introduction to this message, I want to reread a portion of one verse of our scripture, that being verse 11. It says, This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cain of Galilee and manifested forth his glory. In other words, this was the first time that Jesus used a miracle for the purpose of, of showing forth his glory. And what you need to understand is that in the Greek, the word miracle is actually translated sign. So what he's really saying is the beginning of signs did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed on him. And, and the significance of this is that John's not calling attention to the facts themselves, the acts, but rather he's calling attention to the message behind the acts. You see that word sign literally means uh, a marker, an indication, a message. So what was the message of the miracles that Jesus performed? We're told in chapter 20 and verse 31. These are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. That is the reason for the miracles of Jesus. And so as we come in, in our study of the book, book of John to chapter 2, we find the very first of these signs, the very first miracle with a message. And I, I want to just say to you before going any further that there's a message here this morning for you and for me. There's a message here this morning for each and every person who is here because, you see, Jesus is still today in the business of performing Miracles is one of my all-time favorite preachers. Brother Ron Dunn used to say, there's not a thing wrong with any of us that a miracle couldn't cure. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I always remember that little poem. Uh, Got any rivers you think are uncrossable? Any mountains you can't tunnel through? God specializes in things thought impossible. 
He can do what others can't do. Need a miracle in your life today? This one's for you. Now, as a means of context, let me just say that for years, I, as, as I read through this account of Jesus turning uh, the water into wine, I really I couldn't make a lot of sense of it because it, it, it almost appeared to me like a carnival tree. And yet I know that, that the Lord never stooped to things like that. And yet here he is at a wedding feast. They run out of wine. His mother says, do something. And so he performs a miracle and he turns the water into wine. But now let me ask you something. Think about it. Why would Jesus do this at a wedding feast and yet when he stood before Herod to be judged, he, he wouldn't perform a miracle. Well, as we've already said, the key is the fact that it's called a sign. It was the very first sign that manifested forth his glory. So, you see, this was really a preview uh, to what his ministry here on earth was going to be like. In other words, Jesus was saying, you can look at everything that I do in this miracle and you can, you can see the kind of God that I am. And you can see the kind of work that I've come to do. This is what I want us to look at in our time remaining. And as we go through these verses together, there are three things that I want to call your attention to. Three things this miracle reveals to us about Jesus. And the first thing that it reveals to us is the fact that Jesus is sympathetic to the trifles of human life. He is sympathetic to the trifles of of human life, and, and, and I don't know about you, but folks, that means a great deal to me just to know that the Lord is sympathetic over what other people might consider to be trifling. I mean, you know, you have to admit that running out of wine at a wedding wasn't exactly uh, a big deal. I mean, it wasn't a life or death matter, but, but the thing that strikes me as being strange is that not too long before this, Jesus was in the wilderness. He had just come off of a 40-day feast, hungry almost to the point of starvation, and yet he refused to turn stones into bread in order to feed himself. And yet here the same Lord is who refused to turn stones into bread when there was a real need, now turning water into wine simply to keep a young man from being humiliated and embarrassed. See, that teaches a great truth about Jesus, that he is in sympathy with the human trifles and troubles of life. And perhaps you're here this morning, and, and you would have to admit that you've come here, and, and you're a little down, perhaps you're, you're a little depressed over things that are going on in your life. And, and maybe you've not even prayed about it. Let me tell you something. Jesus knows and Jesus cares. What does 1 Peter 5, 7 say? Cast all your care upon Him, whatever it may be. Doesn't matter. Cast all your care upon Him, for He cares for you. You know, back in Matthew chapter 10, Jesus said this. He said, if, if the Heavenly Father is so concerned about little things, that he knows every sparrow that falls to the ground. Don't you think he's more concerned about you? You know, I, I remember as a kid growing up with a BB gun, uh, my dad had one strict rule about shooting birds. Couldn't shoot a mockingbird, couldn't shoot a robin, couldn't shoot uh, a bluebird, and he couldn't shoot a scissor tail. They were special. But I could shoot all the sparrows I could hit. Why? Well, because there were so many of them. And yet, Jesus is so concerned about little things, about trifling things. He knows every sparrow that falls to the ground. And so he asks the question, if I'm so concerned about this, don't you think I'm more concerned about you? And of course the indicated answer is yes. But here, here we find Jesus. He's invited to a wedding feast. And, and, and here's the bridegroom. He has planned for this day for no telling how long. He saved his money. He spent everything he had on this wedding feast, and yet there is a problem. Either more people came 
that they had anticipated, or more than likely the people drank more than he planned on them drinking, but they ran out of wine. They ran out of wine. Now, today, in our society, that probably wouldn't have been that big of a deal. But in Oriental society, saving faith, faith was very important. And so here's this bridegroom on the most important day of his entire life. And he is faced with humiliation and embarrassment. And what does Jesus do? Performs the first miracle of his ministry in order to save this guy from being embarrassed. And that teaches us that he has come into this world in order to be sympathetic with that which we're going through. No matter how trifling it may seem. That's the first thing this sign reveals. The second thing it reveals is Christ's sovereignty over the trifles and troubles of life. His sovereignty over it. It reveals the fact that he is going to do something about them. And so he worked a miracle in taking care of this, this man's problem. But I want you to notice how he did it. He did it, the word says, by merely speaking a word. Look at what the word says in verse 6. There were set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. The firkin was about ten gallons. So they all contained about ten gallons a piece, 20 gallons a piece. And Jesus said unto these servants, fill the water pots with water. And he filled them up to the brim, and he said unto them, draw out now, and bear it to the governor of the feast, and they bear it. And when the ruler of the feast tasted the water that had been made wine, by the sheer force of his word, he changed water into wine. And folks, hear me. This morning, it doesn't matter what the trouble in your life is, the Lord is sovereign over it, and He can perform a miracle in order to take care of it. But the question we have to ask is, what is it that we have to do in order to be able to tap into this resource of divine sovereignty? And the answer is just simply be obedient. That's all there is to it. Now, notice what His mother Mary said to the servants. She said, whatsoever He saith unto you, do it. In other words, just, just be obedient. And there, there are two things about this obedience that brings the sovereignty of God into our life. First of all, it has to be unlimited obedience. Whatever he said, whatever it is he says to you, do it no matter what it is. But not only unlimited obedience, but also unquestioned obedience. When, when Mary said do it, in the Greek, the tense of that word means do it now. Don't stop to think about it. Don't stop to question it. Just do it. And, and you know, when I was going over this, and I thought about what Jesus told those servants to do, I, I couldn't help but wonder what their reaction to that was. I mean, do, do, do you think that perhaps uh, they might have snickered behind his back when they thought of what he was trying to do? I, I, I think maybe Mary anticipated it. Which is why she said, do it and, 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 and do it now. now. I mean, think about it. Had you been a waiter at that wedding feast and someone came up to you that you had never met before and said, here's what we're going to do. They're out of wine. I want you to take these water pots to the well. I want you to fill them to the brim with water. Then take them to the feast. What would your reaction have been? Would you have given unquestioning on? Hesitating obedience? I don't know. I don't know. But that again, I, I think that's why Mary said, don't think about it. You just just do it. And you know, here's the thing, folks. Any Anytime we have to stop long enough to parade the command of God by the jury of our reason and logic, we're in trouble. I think that's the very reason so many Christians today aren't seeing miracles worked in their life. I think that's probably why a lot of churches today aren't seeing God's blessings being poured out like He would like them to because that which God asks us to do sometimes seems illogical and perhaps irrational. And you know, I think that's precisely the same thing that kept the children of Israel out of the land of Canaan for some 40 years. 
You remember? God said, go in and take possession of the land. But you remember what they said? Well, before we do this, we got to see if it's reasonable. And so they sent in 12 spies to spy out the land. That was their first mistake. You don't ever have to spy out anything God's already given your command to do. All you have to do is be obedient. Be obedient. That is what brings the sovereignty of God into play. And that's the second thing I wanted you to see. The Lord's sovereignty over the trifles and troubles of life. And then the third and last thing this sign, this miracle reveals, is not only his sympathy, his sovereignty, but also his sufficiency in the midst of it. His sufficiency in the midst of these troubles. Now, I, I like what the governor of the feast said. He didn't know where the wine came from. But in verse 10, he said unto him, every man at the beginning, to set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine unto now. Now what I like about this story is that whenever Jesus was drawn into the situation, his presence and power was more than sufficient to meet the need. And his sufficiency is revealed in two ways. Number one, it's revealed in the quantity of wine that was produced. How much wine was produced that day? But well, I want to show you something in verse 8 that's very important to understand in the miracle. Look at what the word said. Jesus said unto these servants, Draw out now and bear to the governor of the feet. And the key word is draw out. In the Greek, it means to draw out with a rope and a bucket. And, and you know, if you're just casually reading through this story, you're liable to have the the idea that all the water that was turned into wine was just what was in the, those water pots. That's not so. According to this word, that entire well was turned into water. And you know what that's saying? It's saying that Jesus is always sufficient. It doesn't matter how difficult a problem in your life may be. Bless God, He's sufficient to take care of. Amen. Wow. You know, today is April the 11th. That is our daughter Lainey's birthday. 44 years ago today, she was born eight weeks early. She was in pediatric ICU in Shreveport for about three weeks. And the day we were going to bring her home, uh, the doctor called us into his office and he, he told us, he said, I, I've got to let you know something. Your daughter has a hole in her heart. And if she lived to be a year or two, then we can come and do, do surgery and, and close that hole up. And that was devastating news to us. But we, we took her home and every few weeks we had to take her back to the doctor. I was working, Pam took her and one day, i never forget, his name was Dr. Hawthorne. Uh, Pam, Pam took her lady in there to it and he ran this test and when he came back, he, he said, Miss Webber, I don't, I don't know how to tell you this. But the hole in your daughter's heart is closed. And it doesn't do that on its own. Pam said, we prayed about it. And he, he looked at her and said, are you Pentecostal? <laughs> I guess Baptist didn't have a prayer that I don't know. <laughs> but listen, it doesn't matter how difficult the problem that you're facing may be. Jesus is sufficient. And it's revealed, first of all, in the quantity. But even more, it's revealed in the quality of the wine produced. Look again at verse 10. The governor said unto the bridegroom, Every man at the beginning to set forth good wine. And when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. Now, let me just say, that is a great description of the devil's method of operation. That's, that's always the way that he works. He gives you the best that he has to offer first. And then once he's got you hooked, he gives you the worst. That's also a good description of everything the world has to offer. And notice the end of verse 10. He said, but thou hast kept the good wine until now. That is always the way Jesus works. He saves the best for last. Now I remember when I was first saved, how, how good it was. You know, I, I was 27 years old. My life totally wrecked. 
Nothing going right. But when I asked the Lord to forgive me and take over my life, He changed me completely and it was so good. And, and I'll always remember that. But I'm going to tell you something. You look back over 45 years and, and what I see is that salvation is just getting better and better. As I see God answering prayers in people's lives in this church, as I see God working miracles, I have to say, it's, it's just getting better. But listen, I know this, that when He finally calls me home and I see Him face to face, then I'll be able to truly say, Lord, You kept the best for last. He always saves the best for last. Now, in closing, you may be here this morning and you, you've never experienced Jesus. All you've ever drank of is the wine of the world. But the thing about the world's wine is it just keeps getting worse and worse. But if you will trade the water pots of the world for the well of Jesus, then you'll know what real living is all about. What is, what is it that you that you need? Salvation? He's here. He wants to give it to you. Need a miracle? Got a problem that you think is too difficult for you to handle? He's here. He's still in the miracle working business today. But, here's the thing. You have to be obedient. And here is where we miss it so many times. We come to a service like this. God speaks to our heart. We know what we ought to do. And yet when the invitation is given, we're standing like statues, refusing to move. God's here. He can do anything you need Him to do in your life, but you've got to come. You've got to be obedient. And as the song we'll sing in a moment says, you come just as you are. But I can promise you this. You won't leave just as you came. Want a miracle? <laughs> You'll have to let him do it. Father, we thank you. Lord, we praise you and we thank you that you are indeed sovereign. That you are all power. That there is nothing we ever go through in life that's too difficult for you to handle. And Lord, I know that there's not a one of us here today who don't have problems. We all do. And yet, Lord, somehow or other, even though we were saved, we try to work them out ourselves and it just never, ever works. Lord, I pray that we just be obedient today. And that if you speak to our hearts and tell us what we need to do, we'll do it. Lord, we look into you. And to you alone. And we're going to praise you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. I want you to stand with me. As we sing our hymn of invitation, come just as you are. And I, I do pray that, that if God has spoken to your heart, you'll come. As we sing. Come just as you are. Anyone, will you come?
being with us. 